Hello, everyone, and welcome to my YouTube channel. It is a great pleasure for me to have uh, today a discussion about the markets, the economy, and almost anything that may arise with my good friend, Lance Roberts. How are you, Lance? I'm doing very well. It's so good to see you again. It's been a while. It's been a while. And uh, the last time that we spoke in my channel, it was a tremendous success. People got a lot of added value from you, which is awesome. really, really helpful for, for casual investors and, and small investors, which is uh, what, what comprises most of our audience. So, right. so, what, so what you're saying is, is you already set the bar really high, so we've got to really work today. <laughs> we have to work a little bit hard, but we'll do, <laughs> we certainly will do it. So, All right, let's, let's go. Uh, you know, to start with something easy, uh, let's start with the economy. Okay? Okay. One of the things that everybody seems to be puzzled, and particularly we have a lot of viewers in Latin America and in Europe, they read the headlines about how well the U.S. economy is doing. And at the same time, they don't understand why there's such a high level of discontent and such uh, even, even polarized views about, about the economy. So I would like if you would uh, summarize a little bit for our viewers. How do you see the reality of the U.S. economy? And we can take it from there to what is happening in markets. Sure, sure. So, you know, the, 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 the economic growth in the U.S. has been uh, amazingly strong uh, relative to what expectations were. So just, you know, just for a second, let's just backtrack to 2022. Um, everybody, literally everyone was expecting a recession because the Fed was hiking rates. And that's all. And the uh, yield curve was inverted in, in the 10 year, two year treasury bond. Um, leading economic indicators were negative. So, so basically you had this just this entire suite of evidence that said the U.S. would be in a recession within a few months. And of course, 2023 comes along, no recession occurs. And in fact, in the third quarter of GDP, we grew at 4.9%. The fourth quarter, we're over 3.3%. First quarter is now expected to be somewhere close to 3% growth. And so everybody's kind of scratching their head now. And, and interestingly enough, in 2022, no one expected a recession. Now, nobody is expecting a recession again. So, so you know, we're, we're, we've got a complete reversal. Everybody's convinced the market's just going to grow forever. Uh, one of my favorite investors of all time was Bob Farrell. He used to work at Merrill Lynch. He had 10 rules to invest with. And one of them was when all experts agree, something else is bound to happen. So we'll, we'll see how this turns out. But there's a couple of reasons why the economy has been so strong. So the, 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 if we go back to 2020 as an example, and, and or even in 2021, uh, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve came in, they were doing $120 billion in QE. We were sending $5 trillion in stimulus to households. We actually sent checks to households in the U.S., something we've never done before, ever. And everybody was, of course, surprised you got inflation out of that, but it's exactly how you do it is give consumers the ability to spend. And at the same time, we had moratoriums on rent payments, student loan debts, mortgages. So nobody had to pay any of their debts. They had all this cash to spend. And so we had this massive surge in what we call monetary supply, or M2, the way we measure it in the United States. That, as a percentage of GDP, is at the highest level ever on record. And it was a huge surge. Now, one thing I try to explain to people, and of course, backing that up, we had the Inflation Reduction Act of $1.7 trillion. We had the CHIPS Act of $500 billion. Deficit spending has just been off the rails. And, and all that money is still coming into the economy. So that's, that's supplanting this economic growth that is hitting these headline numbers. Now, if, but one thing I try to explain to people is that in, in, if, if, the, if the world had been normal, right, mm -hmm. since 2000, the U.S. economy was growing at about two and a half percent ish, give or take, right? Two, two and a half percent, pretty much just flat for about 20 years. Yeah. And then when we did all the stimulus, the, the, and I'm talking about nominal GDP here, nominal GDP jumped to 12 percent. So you had this massive spike in, in, in the economy. So the, the way I try to explain this to people are going like, Lance, why aren't we, have, why aren't we in a recession? You know, it's because in order to get to a recession, we have to go all the way down the mountain, back to where we started, and then go into the valley, right? 
So you've got to reverse 12% of economic growth to get to negative numbers. Now we're in that process. We are in the process of reverting that massive spike in GDP, but we have all this underlying stimulus that's coming in that's helping keep rates of economic activity supported. We will have a recession if the Federal Reserve and the government doesn't go back to doing more stimulus spending. If, if everything stays status quo right now and the current programs run out, we will be in a recession, but it'll likely be 2025, 2026, because we've got to continue to reverse this economic growth that we had such a big spike in. And again, it was just so abnormal. If the, if the economy was at two and a half percent when you know all this stimulus was over, we would be in a recession because we've had almost an 8% reversal in economic growth. We have about a 4% negative recession right now, which is extremely deep for the US. We would be in a deep recession if economic growth rates have been normal prior to that whole spike. Absolutely. So I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's it, it's it's that's why it's kind of hard for people to, to grasp a hold of. Yes. Uh, I always explain it to my students the, this is the following way. If I eat 20 donuts a day for a year and then I go to eat four donuts a day, I'm not getting anything. That's basically <laughs> No, no. <laughs> it might be an improvement, huh? but it's not yeah. getting any thinner. No, yeah, it's but I sure like the diet, though. That's the <laughs> so. But what I think is very interesting is is what you say because I think that it's 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 manifesting in a number of things. Now we have seen the largest discrepancy between gross domestic product and gross domestic income in recent history. Gross domestic income is actually showing. Uh, recession while gross domestic product is growing faster than expected. So it's literally just the opposite uh, trend. No, we see it also. In, we see it also in the accumulation of debt, 1.5 trillion of either uh, of added GDP for two trillion of added deficit. No, so That's all right. those things basically make it virtually impossible i mean obviously if you inject two trillion dollars of deficit plus 1.7 trillion dollars of stimulus obviously you're going to extract some kind of gross domestic product out of it but it's certainly bloating the economy the economy in general and i think what is very interesting is what you just said is that if you look at it from the static point of how first you increase money supply and then the the reduction is that we are already in a very severe contraction of that process now. So thanks for sharing your screen with me, Daniel. This, I think this I think this chart will help really kind of uh, solidify the views for for your viewers about what's going on here. You know what this chart is is M two as a percentage of, of economic growth. So if we just look at M two alone, there's been a massive decline in M two because. We didn't we didn't re up the five trillion dollars of stimulus. So when we measure monetary supplies, and, and that's done by looking at M two, the year over year rate of change is negative because we had this massive spike that we didn't renew. So, but if we look at M two as a percentage of the economy, how much money is still in the economy? That's the question, right? And so we can see that massive spike in the COVID stimulus uh, of monetary supply. And ever since then, that monetary supply as per a percentage of the economy is declining as these programs run out. But you can see, look at GDP, how big that spike in GDP was, and we're reversing that process. And we still have a long way to go here just to get back to the long-term uh, trend line of economic growth for the economy, which has been declining, by the way, Ever since 1980, we've been in slower rates of economic growth because we've been putting on more and more debt, running bigger deficits, which all detract from economic activity. It hurts the middle class. It, it, it lowers productivity. And so we're seeing that impact in slower rates of economic growth. But as I was trying to explain earlier, that, that spike is so large, it's just going to take a while to get back to normality. And then you can start talking about a recession. Absolutely. And when you look at this, one of the things that uh, worries people, we were talking about before, is on the one hand, you see that gross domestic, domestic income is moving in the opposite trend of gross domestic product. There's 1.5 trillion of uh, GDP growth for 2 trillion of deficit. And obviously, what that creates as well is 
you've just mentioned it uh, briefly before, is that the middle class is hurting massive now because there's a lot of purchasing power, economic confidence is weakening, etc. So we're basically just getting in the process in which the amount of money injected in the system is not generating any real uh, multiplier effect and ultimately is all the time calling for new stimulus packages, isn't it? That's right. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, if, and if you just take a look at consumer sentiment as an example, you know, it's been improving here as of late. Yeah. And that's because it's that, and, and that's because the stock market's going up. So consumers feel better, right? If you survey them, you know, they do, do you feel better about your finances? Yes, because you know the stock market is going up. But if you actually start asking them things about, you know, their wages relative to the cost of living or their wages being able to support, you know, putting food on the table for their families and being able to to sustain their standard of living. That's becoming a much, much different conversation. And this is where we really start seeing the, the differential between what the economic data says and what's happening actually at homes. And, and there's a, I run this chart that um, I produce every now and then and take a look at the gap between the standard of living and what's happening on households in general. And hold a second, um, my my. It's hard to flip back and forth here. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. So, but this is a this is a chart of okay. So this is the standard of living going back to 1959. So we take a look at the standard of living back in 1959. We inflation adjust that. So this is the average cost for a family of four, basically, to sustain a life in the United States. And so if we go back and look at the stand the cost of living, and we look at incomes, you know, their 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 actual income after inflation and taxes, their disposable income. We take a look at their savings, how much money do they have in the bank on top of their income, and the, the amount of debt that they're taking on. You can see that up to 2004, the, just having your income and savings, you could sustain your standard of living. Yeah, And that was increasing, but I was still able to, to, to make things work. After 2004, after the dot-com crash, we've never really gotten back to normality. And, and we've had the slower rate of economic activity. Wages have continued to decline. And today, it now takes a person about $4,000 a year in debt. And so in other words, every year, I've got to put on an additional 4000 in debt just to sustain my standard of living. And so this is why you see the, the, the debt, which is that kind of orangish shaded uh, mountain in the background, just keeps going up because every year, the average American has to keep going further and further into debt just to make ends meet. So the average debt gap between the cost of living and how much debt they have is about eighteen thousand dollars in a household, and so that's why they're you know that's why they don't see this. What you know, if you take a look across the kind of the bottom eighty percent, they have no money in the bank, they have no money really in savings whatsoever. They're not they're not really participating in the economy. And this is why there's such a big demand in the United States for a lot of socialistic in inputs like free health care, free, free college. You know, you, you can understand why they're, they're going, I can't afford anything. The government needs to start giving me more stuff. But yeah. that's not good for capitalism, by the way. <laughs> it's certainly not good for capitalism. It's certainly not good for growth. And it's even worse, <clears throat> if you think about it, for the same people that demand it, because uh, as I always say to my fellow uh, Amer my friends in America, I come from the future, my friends. I, I'm in a, I'm in the Euro area. I know I know what happens after all of that, which is stagnation. And by the way, the same trend. Uh, you don't see things improving. So the idea that that uh, because you can't afford to get to uh, the end of the month, you need more things from the government. Government can only give you what it has already taken from somebody uh, somewhere, no? And that's that's, right. That is a huge, huge problem because um, I think that the, the, the challenge here is also that the Federal Reserve now, unlike 2004 to 2018, needs to combat inflation. And that is the part of the equation that made it, that makes it difficult because we were used to hearing from the consensus that 
uh, more and more stimulus packages, more and more money supply growth are not going to generate inflation. Now we have uh, persistent inflation. The latest CPI print was a big, big, big uh, negative surprise for those that don't follow money supply. <laughs> not <for> you. <laughs> but but um, but so where does where does this leave the Fed? Because the Fed needs to combat inflation in order to maintain a certain level of, let's say, credence among investors and among uh, citizens. And at the same time, you have this enormous constant stimulus happening. Right. No, the, look, the Fed's in a very tough position. They made a mistake early, you know, up front. Um, so let, let's go back to tw- the March of 2020 for just a second. So March of 2020 is when we shut down the economy in the United States. And, and this was, it was, uh, uh, now look, I'm speaking to you specifically about the United States because that's where I live and I know that, but- It was the same it, everywhere else. Yeah. It, it was everywhere, right? I mean, everybody was like, oh my gosh, you have to wear a mask. You can't go outside. You can't shop. You can't visit with family. I mean, the whole world just kind of uh, shut down. And so at that time, the Federal Reserve stepped in. And so first thing is, is that we issue the first round of stimulus checks to households. Hey, you can't go to work. We understand we caused this. Here's some money to spend. You can't go anywhere to spend it, but here's some money, right? And so we sent checks to households. Now, this was the first, and, and uh, you and I have had this conversation before about modern monetary theory, which is full of fallacy about it's just, you know, this is the, you know, the government's debt is somebody else's assets. Yes, maybe on an accounting term, but not in the real world. And so we had our first experience with MMT, which was sending money directly to households. The result of that was, is you had an individuals going out and doing lots of things with that money. They were, they were buying stuff that they didn't really need. They were buying new computers because they couldn't go to work. So they were buying computers to, to work at home. Uh, they were gambling in the stock market. You know, Robinhood, the, the trading app was going crazy because everybody was buying, you know, trading stocks because they couldn't gamble on sports. And so we had all this in, this input into the economy from all that money that we put in. Then, then what the Fed did, their mistake was they cut you know, rates were already at zero at this point. <clears throat> and they started doing $120 billion a month in QE. And this was supposed to help the economy. That was a huge mistake. They should have known that as soon as you sent checks to households, you were going to have a spike in inflation. Be- because look, it's supply and demand. The very basics of economy. You know, if you study basic 101 economics, they show you this, this chart of two lines of supply and demand. And where those intersect is where you have equilibrium. Well, if you shut off supply and give people money, you're going to shift that whole scale to upwards. So in other words, you've got increased demand and no supply. And so equilibrium of where price is moves up. So the Federal Reserve, who's 400 PhDs in economics, should know this basic economic equation and not cut rates. They should have hiked rates. They should not have done QE. They should have understood that, hey, we're we're going to hike rates here a bit. Not a lot. We're going to hike rates from zero to one percent. And we're not doing QE. And we're going to let the economy absorb all this capital that just got injected. But they didn't do that. And so now we have 9% inflation and the, the Fed's going, oh, uh, well, uh, yeah, it's transitory. Don't worry about it. It's going to go away. Well, you never stopped the inputs. We kept doing more. We kept doing the Inflation Reduction Act, CHIPS Act, this act, you know, extending child tax credits, all this other stuff. We kept, and, and of course, moratoriums on payments, which is effectively giving people money to spend. And they're, and they're surprised. They sit back and they're like, oh, we've got inflation. Well, no kidding. You've got inflation. Obviously, you've hit a hot button with me, Dave. <laughs> so, um, so we've got this inflation. Now the Fed decides very late in the game to hike rates, which they, they should do, right? They should have done this. And they did quantitative tightening. Okay, great. It's fine. But in the background, we're doing the bank term funding program. So we're giving banks now money to arbitrage with, which is putting more money back into the financial system. You know, we're doing all these other supports within the economy. And now the Fed immediately turns around and says, hey, we're going to start cutting rates. Why? You've still got 3% inflation and potentially more if we keep doing more and more stimulus. We keep spending more money running increased deficits. You're not going to get 9% inflation, but you're going to push inflation back up to 3 or 4 You should be keeping rates right where they are. And in fact, from the Fed's position, 
if I'm Jerome Powell, I'm like, I'm not doing nothing because I have the best position. I've got a raging stock market. I've got an economy growing at over 3%. Everybody's doing okay. Consumer confidence is rising. And so everything there's in there and take a look at credit spreads. If you yeah. take a, if you ever want to know if there's a risk in the financial markets or the economy, all you got to look at is credit spreads. Credit spreads between triple B rated bonds and, and A rated bonds are basically nothing there. I mean, there, you do not get paid any any premium for taking risk in triple B rated bonds. And that means there's no financial stress anywhere in the system. So if I'm the Fed, I've got Nirvana. I've got five and a half percent interest rates. I've got my my gun for the next recession is now fully reloaded. So I just sit back and wait for a recession. If I'm the Fed, I keep doing quantitative tightening. I try to get that balance sheet down as much as possible because we're going to have a recession someday, right? It might be 10 years from now, but we'll have a recession at some point. And now the Fed's got five and a half percent interest rates to cut to support an economic slowdown. And they'll reduce their balance sheet. So now they go back to doing quantitative easing to support the economy. But yeah. doing it now makes no sense whatsoever. But I'm not Jerome Powell. So there you go. No, but it's, uh, but if you think about it from the pure perspective of the Federal Reserve and what they look at, you look at core PCE, you look, mm -hmm. at, uh, you look at GDP, you look at uh, unemployment. Where is the, the rationale behind cutting rates? There's absolutely yeah. nothing. This is the yeah, problem. You see, this is the problem for the people that defend the bubble economy. Is that right. you avoid a recession, you certainly get a certain level of very low unemployment, even though real wages are negative, and even though people don't feel that everything is fantastic. But hey, the headline figures are there. The headline figures are showing that everything is fine, and at the same time, the stock market needs those rate cuts to maintain yeah. the multiple expansion no so that's that's the yeah. point where everything sort of seems to be colliding is that it's what the 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 stock market requires versus what the federal reserve looks at don't you think well no you're absolutely that was my that was my kind of concluding point all of this is to remember that the federal reserve and this goes for if this goes for all the central banks around the world the central banks are the bankers bank, right? So the bank, and especially at the Federal Reserve level, the major banks in the US, JP Morgan, et cetera, they're members of the Federal Reserve. They get a dividend from the Federal Reserve every year um, for their membership in the Fed. So all that balance sheet income statement, they get money from that, right? So, mm -hmm. th so these, these banks have a very beneficial interest in what the Fed does. And so when the Fed is making policy, the banks are in the air going, hey, man, you know, this this five and a half percent interest rate, you know, this isn't great for our loan book. This isn't great for our, you know, our loan collateral uh, because they own, tre we do fractional reserve banking here. So we have, uh, you know, treasury bonds as collateral in the books for these fractional reserve loans that we put out. And, and so, you know, they're talking to the Fed saying, hey, you know, this interest rate's a little bit tight. You're forcing us to pay a whole bunch of money out in money market dividends that we didn't have to, you know, for years, you got zero on money market. That was free money for the for, the, for these banks at five and a half percent money market rates. And now all of a sudden, these banks have to pay out capital. So they're talking to the Fed going, hey, you know, stock market's great. This is awesome. But we need to ease up on this other side of it so we can get more profitable, more profitable back on this. So there's a very big collusion between the banks and the Fed that everybody needs to not forget. Yeah. And because of the massive window of liquidity that the Federal Reserve has opened and uh, basically allowed regional banks to survive throughout uh, 2023 and now 2024 by literally giving them money uh, from at 100% value for their, for their long-term bonds that they need to get liquidity. Obviously, that is fueling the inflation fire. It is also <laughs> making, it's also making credit, the credit environment a lot looser. It's obviously these yep. banks continue to lend without a problem, etc. So all of the things that the Fed tries to accomplish with rate hikes, basically are not happening because there is no significant reduction in credit uh, supply. Certainly, there is, there is no tightening of, of, or at least significant tightening of financial conditions. 
So for the Fed, it's basically just hope for the best that inflation is going to drop. But it's easy to bring inflation down from 9% to 4 But from 4 to 2 that's a tough, tough one, no? Yeah, well, you know, we need every you know we need to have a quick primer on how we measure inflation real quick, yeah. and this this will help people understand, you know, also why what you just said is so very true. Going from four to two is much more difficult than nine to four, and the reason is is that we measure inflation on a year over year basis. So, um, in in the U.S., a gallon in the, <laughs> in the U.S. a gallon of gasoline is four dollars a gallon, roughly. Uh, I know y'all do it in liters, but <laughs> you know, we do oh. gallons. Every time that I hear four dollars a gallon and I convert it to euros per liter, I I weep. But <laughs> but I understand that for the for an American citizen, that is a very very steep price. My it, friend it say fifty eight percent taxes on gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and look, don't don't worry. We're gonna join. We're jo we're rapidly moving here in the U.S. to join the EU and how we do economics. So we'll be there soon. Yeah, uh, but. But, but back to our equation. So in January of 2023, let's assume that gas is $4 a gallon. Yeah. If In January of 2024, 12 months later, if gas is $4 a gallon, it's 0% inflation because it's the same price. So we just measure, all we're doing is measuring the price differential from one year over the next. Okay, that's an important point because when we go back and we were at 9% inflation, we were having inflation jumps in CPI of over 1%, right? And that's a huge number in a month for inflation. So we were seeing inflation jumps of 1, 1.1%, 1 1.2% in a month. So flash forward a year later, we're now comparing inflation rates of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3% to a 1% increase. So this is why you had this massive drop from 9% to 4 went very quickly. Now, and to your point, Daniel, is that going forward, we're now measuring 0.2.3 versus 0.2.1. And so that, that will take a much longer time to now go from 4 to 3 to 2 than I think what a lot of people appreciate. You know, we'll, we're going to get to 2%. And I'll, yeah. I can explain to you why we'll be at 2% inflation. But that's because of the debt. It's because of actual economic growth. It's what's actually happening underneath the surface with the consumer. We will be at 2% because economic growth is going to return to sub 2% because of the debt that we've taken on. We're now $34 trillion in debt and climbing. And that's just federal government debt. If we lay on you know, consumer debt, bank debt, all the other stuff that we have out there, house mortgages, all that, we're talking about $70 trillion in debt. So- it's a tremendous amount of debt that's weighing on top of a $22, $23 trillion economy. We're about $4.50 in debt for every dollar's worth of economic growth now. So because of that debt differential, economic activity will slow because debt is not productive. Mm -hmm. So we'll eventually be at 2% growth, but it's going to take time to get back there, as we were talking about before, just to work all that monetary excess out of the system. But as economic growth slows, so will inflation. And so will bond yields on the 10-year treasury. There's a long-term historical correlation, very high long-term historical correlation. If you want to know where interest rates are going to be on the 10-year treasury, all you have to do <clears throat> is estimate where economic growth and inflation will be in two years' time. So if inflation and interest rates are going to be at 2%, yields will be at 2%. Yeah. Because, yeah. Those, because interest rates on bonds are simply the calculation by borrowers of saying or lenders saying, if I'm going to loan you money uh, in this economy, I've got to compensate for inflation and economic growth and other opportunities. So yields will follow where that is. So you know, people expecting 10% yields on 10-year treasury, that's never going to happen. One reason is, is the US economy with so much debt can't afford high yields. The reason we've been at zero yields for so long is to supplant the ability to increase debt levels to support 2% economic growth. And just by the way, one comment, and I'm gonna, I'll am gonna shut up, is that prior to 2000, the year 2000, the last century, I know that sounds like forever ago. <laughs> In the last century, if you got to 2% economic growth, that was considered pre-recessionary. That's where economists worried about economic activity at 2%. We need to start worrying because we're really close to a recession. 
Yeah. Now, today, 20 years later, we're just hoping we can get 2% and keep it, right? So exactly. and that's, a fun, that's a function of the debt. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that you, you've just nailed it, is that so many people look at inflation and they think that a reduction in CPI, in the consumer price index, is a reduction in prices. No, no, it's not. It is a lower pace of rise in prices. And uh, and you need to get rid of all that excess money that is parked in so many areas of the economy. But at the yep. same time, we're in an election year. So in an election year, I mean, I just saw that the January deficit in the United States were ballooned by almost uh, 50% uh, from 12, uh, uh, 12 billion to 20, almost 22 billion, if I'm not wrong. That's but the crazy. thing is, if, with that massive increase in deficit, obviously deficits are printing money. People tend to forget, yeah. tend to forget that. So with that increase in deficit, it's going to be difficult to control inflation. But at the same time, that is likely to continue to fuel uh, the discrepancy between markets and the real economy, no? Yep. Oh, absolutely. And just by the way, just you know, to your point, we're running the biggest deficit on record at any point in history outside of a crisis. Yeah. Right. Or recession. Hmm. And, and so that that really just tells you kind of we just run amok with monetary policy here in the United States. And, and you know, it's a shame because everybody talks about, oh, we need to be more responsible with our fiscal budget. There's no responsibility in government around fiscal monetary policy. It is simply a function of just how much can I spend to try to keep to stay in office. Right. I just want to buy votes. Um, but, you know, to your point, this this is all going to play out ultimately at you know, there's a price to pay for this. And we'll pay this price either through much slower economic growth, disinflation to deflation at some point, and we will pay a price in the stock market as well. Mm. The stock market is priced for absolute perfection on earnings expansion, earnings growth, and the economy. Yeah. And so in order to have earnings meet the current expectations of what the market is pricing. And so the market's running up on expectations where we have stronger rates of earnings growth. Well, in order to have that, you've got to have stronger rates of economic growth. Yeah. And that means we're going to have to be growing at three or four or 5% growth economically, which everybody has now all of a sudden come back to and said, oh, this is, this is, we're back to normal. We're now growing at four or 5%. Not without the debt increase you aren't. And so if you're not going to continue to run you know the deficits there's your problem yeah. and you know this is this is something that people don't quite understand is that talk about the stock market real quick from 1900 to 2023 the market averaged eight percent a year hmm. okay from but that includes the years from 2009 to 2000 to, to present to 2023 from that so if we if we if we lop off and we look from 20, 2008 the financial crisis back to 1900, the 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 markets grew about 7.98 percent. So right at eight percent, and that includes that's total return with dividends. Yeah. From 2009 to 2023, we grew at 12 percent. Now that's a 50 percent increase on 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 stock market growth over what was seen over the last 108 years, the previous 108 years. We were growing 50 percent faster. How did we do that? Well, we did that because of $43 trillion worth of monetary and fiscal policy being injected into the economy. QE, TAMP, HARP, you know, all these programs, the, the stimulus checks, all that. $43 trillion. So if we don't continue to inject that type of, of capital infusion going forward, stock market growth rates, economic growth rates are going to revert back to a non-monetary stimulus type environment, which will be... For, for most people who have never seen, been through a bear market, you know, you and I went through uh, through 2008. I've been around for 35 years. So I, I saw 87 crash. Um, you know, I've been through all this stuff. And there are very few people that have actually been through a bear market before. And so when you go back from 12% growth rates in, in the markets to eight or seven or six, that's going to feel very disappointing for a lot of people. But that's what's going to happen Unless, and again, maybe it's possible, 
we're going to keep doing QE 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we're going to continue doing all these monetary spendings and keep running up bigger deficits, you know, that's certainly possible. But there's a there's a real economic cost for that, because as we talk about, um, you know, quite often is this wealth gap between the top 10 percent of income earners and the bottom 90 percent. The top 10 percent of income earners in the United States own 93 percent of the stock market. The bottom ninety percent own hardly anything at all, and that's yeah. why there's such a that's why there's such a cry about the wealth gap and inequalities. And look, we have lots of problems in the United States. You know, we you know we have riots and we have all this complaining about we have racial divides. We have all this stuff going on, and just look at the headlines, right? And we've got the most divisive po politics ever in my lifetime. It's it's, it's shameful what goes on in Washington and and and, the, and politics, and it's shameful what the politics and the media do to keep the division in the US so broad when it really shouldn't be that way at all. But this all has roots in financial instability. Absolutely. When people, when, when people are not comfortable and they can't make ends meet, it's not their fault. And they look for a reason to lash out. And look, you know, you know history better than I do. You know, but the French Revolution, what you know, the you know what happened in the United Kingdom and you know in England, and you know all this goes. You know, basically every civilization in history that fell prey to bad monetary economics eventually led to 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 civilian revolts that were bloody and 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 bad for the outcome. Now we went through a dark period, came out better on the other side, but you know we're setting up a very bad precedent in the United States and and you know you can almost kind of see where the inroad of that gets to oh i completely agree with you is that the problem of this insane fiscal and monetary policy is that it hurts those that it, that it pretends to defend <laughs> is that those that earn a wage and those that have deposit savings get their wages destroyed uh, because the purchasing power of the currency is diminished and they get their deposit savings also losing their value because and they therefore their ability to climb the ladder is is weaker i always say that socialism doesn't redistribute from the rich to the poor but from the middle class to politicians if yeah. people don't understand that what they cannot see is that with those policies that are that they are constantly saying are going to defend the uh, I, I, every time that I watch uh, U.S. Uh, political debates, they always say families talking in the kitchen on the kitchen table, not talking. You know, the, the concept of the kitchen table discussion. The kitchen table discussion, my friend, is that your wages are being eroded by a by a currency that is worth less year after year. And that the government is spending in that currency a lot more than the economy generates. So you mentioned the accumulation of debt. Last year, 2023, was the worst year in terms of GDP growth uh, adjusted for economic, uh, for sorry, for the accumulation of debt since the 1930s. So no wonder, one, the stock market goes through the roof, two, the average citizen uh, gets exceedingly angry about the situation. And as you very well say, we don't know. <coughs> Sorry, we don't know when, but we know is how. And we know that this ends badly for the average, for the average citizen. Mm -hmm. right. Now, the problem that I see also is that um, we look at Japan, mm -hmm. we look at the Euro area, and we say, well, you know they're doing it a lot worse, and it, they they don't they don't disappear. No, so let's copy. Right. I think that that's that's what I find insane when I go to the United States is to hear my 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 dear friends in America think, hey, if Japan has two hundred and twenty percent debt to GDP, why can't we? No, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and well, there's look, a con yeah, there's, there's a huge consequence for that though. Absolutely. You know, yeah. It's just look, and it's very interesting right now. We have a very interesting anomaly going on in Japan. Japan, the Nikkei is very close to actually finally getting back to where it was in 1989, <laughs> right? So for 40 years, the Nikkei has been underwater. It's very close to getting back to break even now. So after if you were if you'd bought the Nikkei in 1989, you're almost back to break even. So good news <laughs> for you, but it makes no sense. 
The economy just went back into a recession. The Japanese economy has rolling recessions about every three to four years. And so it's, they get out of recession, they're out of recession for a little bit and they go back into recession. And, and so the reason the stock market's doing so well is because the Bank of Japan is basically buying everything. They own 80% of the ETF market. They own virtually all the bond market. And then the U.S. uses Japan for a carry trade by swapping currencies to, to take up the leverage and then, um, you know, to, to invest in the stock market on a leverage basis. So that's helping the Nikkei. Yeah. But for the, average, for the average Japanese citizen, their youth is most of them are living at home. They can't get a job. They won't get married because they don't have any financial future. The older generation is living longer and longer and the pension system is becoming more and more burdened. Um, and yet, yeah, they're running 220% of debt to GDP and they haven't blown up yet. And, and this is one thing I do, you know, try to, you know, I get a lot of emails from people that are like, well, you know, all this debt's going to cause the end of the United States. I'm like, slow down with that because Japan's been doing this for a long time. They're an economy that's about one third the size of the U.S. They're doing fiscal stimulus three times the size of the U.S. on a relative basis. Exactly. And so you can keep things going for a really long time on the surface. And, and this is the this is the you know, this is really kind of where we are in the United States is that we've got this really great looking car. It's got a beautiful paint job. It looks fantastic. Just don't open the hood because there's nothing in there but two chipmunks and a rubber band. So, you know, and so for the average American, it looks great on the outside, but you start talking to the average American, it's not good. And, and you really hit the nail on the head, which is all these programs, uh, you know, what, you know, and, and look, it's even, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say two, two bad words. I'm probably going to get you banned for this, but climate change, um, you know, all this thesis about climate change, whether you agree with it or not is irrelevant. It transfers wealth from the taxpayer, the middle class, to the wealthy. All hmm. these programs, well, they sound great in nature. Once you dig down and behind them, it is a transfer of wealth from those that consume to those that produce. Look, climate change made Elon Musk the richest man in the world because we all went and bought electric vehicles in the name of climate change. So the middle class, and this is what I mean, the middle class bought very expensive cars to help with climate change, I think it's a great idea, right? I mean, we should all contribute to to, to keeping our uh, you know keeping our climate safe. I agree with all that, but we have to understand that there's a policy behind this, and we extracted capital from those that really can't afford it, and gave it to those who are producing the goods or the service that meet these political you know agendas. Yes. And this is why we always have to look behind these political agendas and say, what's really the benefit? And yeah. who is it that actually benefits from it? And it's not the middle class, unfortunately. You're yeah, absolutely correct. I think that uh, there is, it's one thing is, is, this is the problem, is one thing is the objective, which we all agree with, obviously. And the other is the means. And the problem is that it, it become almost impossible to have a healthy debate about why the means are not helping precisely the objective. Interestingly yeah. enough, there's a window of hope for you, is that in the European Union, the use of the 2030 agenda has actually driven to a debate why which people are saying, look, you know, we all agree with the objective. The means are not working, but they're not working, not just not working for the middle class today and for the agricultural sector or the farms, etc. Is that it's not helping either in the objective of decarbonization, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, look at Germany. Germany is now more dependent on coal than it was 25 years ago after uh, almost uh, 500 billion euros of uh, subsidies to, to support these policies, no? So ultimately, that's what that is the promise, is that in, in Spain, we have a saying that says that uh, hell is full of good intent, no? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, good intentions, phenomenal, absolutely. We have we share the good intentions and we share the objective. The means are the problem, and I think that uh, to circle this back to the to the equity market is is precisely the fact of what we're seeing in Japan is that you see this multiple expansion, and the average citizen 
I mean, an av the average family, less than 4% of the savings of the average family is in the stock market in Japan. Yep. Less than 4%. In the United States, it's a little bit more, but it's not a lot. Well, it is double that, but still very little relative to the relative to the entire the entire part of savings, huh? which yeah. brings us probably to, okay, what is, in your view, the next step? Because it looks like, you know, there's no turning back. It looks like the, the next step with centralized, with central bank digital currencies and everything is actually more financial repression, not less. Yeah. So how do you see, so now we are, our, our viewers, investors, that uh, got a tremendous amount of value from our last conversation are waiting for, okay, Lance and Daniel uh, again have made our evening less uh, enjoyable by talking, of, uh, by talking about this horrible future, but how do we protect ourselves? And, and what do you think are the main drivers that people should be looking at? Well, look, uh, you know, here's, you know, all these conversations, you know, in the big picture, right? It's 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 not great, and and there's certainly a lot of problems. We've just been through the whole litany yeah. of things that, and 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 you're right. Everybody's sitting there like, oh my gosh, you know, why am I invested in the stock market at all? I mean, it's all going to come crashing down. And and the answer is is that markets can remain irrational for far longer than you can imagine. And 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 so as uh, look, I'm a portfolio manager. Um, my firm manages about 1.5 billion in assets for people just like you. I mean, that are you know in, in retirement, near retirement, thinking about retirement. They've got their whole life's nest egg saved up, and 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 they just want to make sure it's going to grow and not completely disappear. And and so that's my job is to make it grow and, and protect it from risk. And so you know, as a function of that, yes, we have these broad macro views that you and I have discussed. We can clearly see there's problems underneath the surface, but that doesn't mean markets are going to adhere to those today. Now, eventually reality and fantasy will meet. So right now we're living in fantasy world in the stock market. It's all about artificial intelligence. It's all about, you know, uh, the, the future of the economy. We have these exponential growth rates and earnings, and it's all going to be fantastic. Now, we know that's not true. You know, that's not true. But that's what the markets think at the moment. So as investors, we have to participate in the market. We can't, we can't sit at home and be all in cash. And, and for the first time in a decade, you actually can be in cash and make a little bit of money. But we do have to be invested. And, there's, and, and we can invest in, in companies that have good long-term earnings growth. They have strong dividend track records. Um, yes, if the market gets hit, they're going to go down some. But they're not going to go down 50, 60, 80, 90 percent, which a lot of these tech companies that are running off to the moon right now, that have no earnings. Yeah. They have no income to speak of. Uh, they have very weak balance sheets trading at multiples that we've never seen before in history. Price to sales multiples of 20, 30, 40 times. That's where your risk is. Those, those, are, the, those are the stocks everybody loves right now. Those are the NVIDIAs and the Eli Lillys and all these type of companies that are just running off to the moon, it's okay to chase those if you want. Just you have to you keep very close stops. You have to be willing to sell them. You know, just understand the risk you're taking on. The bulk of your portfolio should be in longer duration assets. Com again, companies that pay a strong dividend, have stable earnings growth, have you know, the, the basically are a function of the economy over time. Those will protect you. In the event of market downturn, and 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 for goodness sake, don't forget about bonds in your portfolio because Treasury bonds, U.S. Treasury bonds, for me, um, and even if I'm a European citizen, I'd buy U.S. Treasuries right now, Ooh, probably over. over. Yeah. So, go ahead. No, absolutely, absolutely. I think that uh, that is, uh, you know, that one of the things that precisely because of the of the monetary imbalances that we have just mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I mean, the, the long-term trends on fiat currencies like the euro actually tell you that you have to be invested in U.S. Treasury, okay? Because yeah. it's, it's a world of relative, you very well said. And I think that yeah. you've said something that is exceedingly important and we repeat quite often, which is uh, we need to analyze the economy. We need to be realistic about the economy. Being realistic about the economy allows you 
to follow the trends in the market and to look at opportunities in the market without ignoring how the market works and without getting too excited about things that are uh, way too expensive. So it's actually a way of, of, of understanding the opportunities that arise, no? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, my point about U.S. Treasuries is, is that at least for now, um, it may eventually change someday. Um, U.S. is the reserve currency of the world right now. So yeah. when, whenever a country, whether it's Spain or France or Russia, whoever, if they need to store U.S. dollar reserves, they store that in U.S. Treasuries. So if the economy slows, as we expect it will, if inflation falls, as we expect it will, yields will fall, pushing bond prices up on treasuries. And because, of, and I'm going to use a word that, don't worry about it, y'all can Google, it's called convexity. But it's the difference in duration and price. But, you know, as the, the in, as in inflation falls and economic growth slows, bond, yields will fall, pushing bond prices higher. So if I own longer duration treasuries, 10 or, or 20 year duration treasuries, then I'm going to have the biggest price appreciation when I get those those lower rates of inflation and economic growth. So over the next several years, I expect that treasury bonds will actually outperform U.S. equities on a relative basis. That is very important for people for people to understand, also from the perspective of international investors, because uh, when everybody is following the same insanity in terms of monetary and fiscal policy, the winner is not the winner because they do better, but because they do less worse <laughs> or less badly. Now, yeah. and in the case of the United States, the United States dollar remains the world reserve currency, not because the Fed is, is Austrian and, and, and being sort of like gold, but because the policy of the others is much more aggressive and negative. And we mentioned prior the, the challenges of implementing policies that are completely opposite to inflation or, or price stability. Well, look at the European Central Bank, what it is doing now. No? So that's why you have to be invested in, in US treasuries in this in this period, precisely understanding the monetary phenomenon globally, no? What do you think of hard assets? What do you think of real estate? What do you think of uh, gold? What, what are, do you have any any particular preference there? Uh, yeah, so you know, th there's you know, gold is interesting, um, you know, because there is a natural bias, yeah, towards gold as a as a as a protector against inflation and a, a protection a protection of assets. Um, the interesting thing about gold is is that it's done okay in the last year or so, but since 2014, it has vastly underperformed virtually every other asset class. So, you know, if I'm if I'm trying to protect my wealth, right? So I need so let, let's back up to a very basic premise about investing that eludes most most individuals. Why do we invest in the markets? Most individuals approach investing in the market as a way to 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 build wealth, right? I'm going to get rich investing in the stock market so I can save less and have the market do my work for me. That's the wrong way to approach investing, period, because investing that way is just gambling. And, and we're just taking on a lot of excess risk in order to generate return. The goal of investing was, and really always will be, taking my savings today and making sure they're adjusting for inflation so I have the same purchasing power in the future. So if I have a million dollars today to live on, that million dollars need to have the same purchasing power 30 years from now. So that 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 dollar's gonna have to be worth a lot. That invested dollar has to be worth a lot more. So so maybe I only have to grow in order to do that, maybe I need to grow my portfolio at three or four percent a year. Yeah. Now let's just pick let's pick four percent as an example. So I'm saying uh, to, to in order to, to meet my inflation adjusted savings goals by the time I retire in 30 years, I need four percent growth. But, you know, the markets are doing really good right now. So maybe I go five. Maybe I shoot for 5%. Okay, that's just a 1% increase. That's a 25% increase in the rate of return in the portfolio because I went from four to five. But that requires almost a 100% increase in the amount of risk I've got to take to generate that 1% additional rate of return. Risk is not a function of how much money you make. It's how much money you lose when something goes wrong. So the more risk I take on, the more potential risk I, I put myself in of setting myself behind my goal 
Uh, and, and this is why most people in the United States never actually save enough for retirement because they get into a bear market, they sell at the bottom, they buy at the top, they do everything wrong, right? And so if I build a portfolio to generate a, a, a reasonable rate of return that will adjust my savings and my job as an individual is to make sure I'm saving a lot, that's my goal. My job to, to build wealth is to save a lot of money, let the market adjust for the inflation over time, and you and you'll get to your goal intact. And and so when we start talking about asset classes, gold is is certainly there, but it's been a big drag on portfolio performance since 2014. I, I'm not anti gold. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just I'm just saying as as we have to look at things as are they doing the job that they're purported to have do, uh, to to do? And yes, gold gets into phases where it has a big run. 2020, 2022 is a good example of this. 9% inflation, gold was negative. It did nothing to protect against inflation in 2022. So we have to look at the assets that we're going to invest in and say, are they doing, and it's like anything, right? You run a business. I've got 10 employees. I've got one guy that never shows up to work. Is he doing the job he's supposed to be doing, right? No. And, and so I, I fire him. And, and so right now, gold has, has been working better this year. So we have some exposure there. But if commodities in general, if we get into a much slower economic environment or a recession, commodities will not perform in that environment. So I don't want to be long, hard commodities in a recessionary environment. Right now, they're doing OK. So I've got no problem. Yeah. Real estate. Real estate is not a bulk item. Right. So it's just I'm going to do real estate. Exactly. Okay, so I, go, I go buy a real estate. You do not want to be in commercial real estate in the United States for sure. There is a massive overload of commercial real estate and nobody's going to work. Residential real estate is a different story. Retail real estate is a potentially different story. But though, but retail resident uh, retail real estate is tied to the economy. If, if, if the economy is slowing down, people aren't shopping as much, then retail becomes a problem. Housing in the United States, we have an undersupply of, of residential homes yeah. because BlackRock bought 44% of all the homes in 2023. So we've had a lot of homes turned into rentals. And so there is a, a lack of supply of residential real estate in the United States. So there's some opportunity in residential real estate if the Fed starts cutting rates. I like storage in real estate space because people in the United States, we have a bad consumption habit. We buy a bunch of crap we don't need, and then we have to rent a place to store it. it makes no sense. But I like I like storage real estate. I think there's an opportunity. Those are more uh, recession resistant type real estate holdings. Uh, and when you talk about public storage and those type of things. Um, you know, I, again, going back to other assets, you know, I, I like bonds. They're stable. You get a return of uh, principal. And, and you get a guaranteed interest rates. Can't go wrong with that ever. Um, and especially today where you can get 4% on a 10-year treasury. It's really not hard math, right? I, if I need 4% to grow my money, I just buy treasuries. I'm good, right? I got 4%. Um, you know, so international uh, emerging markets have really underperformed. Emerging markets have, you know, there's been a lot of talk over the last several years about, oh, emerging markets are so cheap on a value, a relative valuation basis. And that's always the key argument to go, emerging markets are cheap relative to the US. But emerging markets aren't cheap relative to emerging markets, right? So when, if, you know, Brazil is not cheap relative to Brazil. And, and the, the, these countries are dependent on countries like the United States to sell their goods to their exporting countries. We're a huge importer of foreign goods. If we sneeze, in other words, we go into recession here, foreign, foreign economies get the flu because they're dependent upon our consumption. So emerging markets have been a major underperformer really since 2009, been a huge lag. Same thing with developed international, same argument there about valuations, but really have not been good performers. Um, unfortunately, if you take a look across uh, spectrums, the essence, domestic U.S. stocks have been the best performers over the last you know, 13 years. Now, this has all been a function of massive monetary policy and interventions, et cetera. That will change. And so we're watching these other asset classes for a change in relative performance that is sustained, not just a, not a bump that lasts for a couple of months, but a sustained change in performance. And then when that begins to occur, and as we're seeing changes into the economic dynamics of the United States, we'll begin to shift assets to these other these other areas of the markets. But 
you know, for the moments right now, it's U.S. stocks and bonds um, really that's leading leading the charge here. We agree with it completely. We think that uh, from the monetary perspective and from the level of uh, coincidence between the goals of the minority shareholder and the leaders of the of the corporations of the quoted stocks, certainly uh, there is a huge huge difference between uh, U.S. stocks and U.S. bonds relative to relative to other economies, and obviously. I come back to the point we've been mentioning about all this, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. deficit, etc. Uh, think about this. Germany, the Eurozone is in a massive recession in the middle of a, an, the largest actually stimulus package in its recent history. The, the next fund, the next generation EU fund, solemnly named next generation, which is the previous generation, same, same principle. Right. Lance, what a great discussion. I think that our viewers are, will get a tremendous amount of value. We will get all of the details to follow you. Uh, everybody that is watching should follow you on Twitter and on social media. And yeah. uh, we should do this more often. Thank you so much for your insight and for the for the great conversation. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Anytime you want to do this, just uh, let me know. We'll, we're glad to do it. We'll do that. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, leave your comments below and keep defending freedom. Thank you very much.